What's that old house? Yeah, I like that like mosaic out of bricks over there. That's fun. My bicycles are rollerblading in the building. Uh oh. Whoa. That is awesome. That's crazy. How do those grow in here? My name is Louisa Whitmore. I'm passionate about good design, particularly good architectural design. Because of the way the, it's all skylights up there and all that construction, it's like actual trees growing inside. I would have thought for that they would have had to have like an open roof. That's really cool. It would be amazing to study in this space, I think. On social media, I talk a lot about urban design. I've built up a social media following based on my likes. Why yellow? But I do really love the idea behind them. And sometimes dislikes of buildings. This building, 432 Park Avenue in New York City, is the worst building in the world, based on absolutely nothing. Architecture has always fascinated me, and I guess it fascinates many other people too. I've started to see a pattern in what I like and don't like. And it usually has to do with whether nature is integrated into the design. That concept is referred to as biophilic design. It's the integration of natural elements into the built space. I want to learn more. So I'm going to talk to some experts who will explain biophilic concepts and share how nature-based designs can impact every aspect of our lives. We've been encroaching on nature for far too long. Maybe it's time we let nature encroach on us. What, what do you think biophilia is? Um, uh, um, I found myself having to Google it. When I first heard it, I thought it was a disease. Okay, yeah. Uh, that's actually a very good question. So, and people tend to have different answers to this question. Biophilia, by definition, is the love of life. Uh, using the patterns and the processes in nature and applying them to, de to design, particularly architecture. So designing buildings so that we have a tree in the atrium or a green roof, and those are great. Those are really interesting ways of bringing greenness into cities. At the same time, I think we limit ourselves if we think just about buildings. So whether it be forms, it be sounds, it be smells, it be sense and touch, it's bringing kind of those elements of the natural world into the built environment. The human brain loves the pattern of sunlight filtering through tree branches and leaves. Right, which can be a very abstract thing to create with lighting patterns, but if you do it, man, it's powerful. We're kind of genetically driven uh, towards spaces that resemble nature-like elements. I headed to a rooftop garden at the University of British Columbia to learn more about the role nature can play in good design. Hi. Hey, Louisa, welcome to UBC. So glad to be here. <laughs> We're here in the Center for Interactive Research on Sustainability. Should we go check it out? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. This building is all about um, biophilic design and sustainability, and the building gets us to interact with nature. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so this is the rooftop garden. Cool. So we have this kind of um, messy rooftop garden here that also provides pollinator habitat and cools the building, and we have sort of greenness along um, one side of the building that helps to provide shade. There's a concept called the 330-300 rule, and I think it's a really interesting way to look at biophilia or biophilic design in our neighborhoods. All of us should have access or views of three trees outside of our windows of our house, 30% canopy cover in our neighborhood, and a park or other green space within 300 meters of our house. That would allow us to experience biophilia on a daily basis. I got some seeds on me, little burrs. Yeah. I am trying to act as a seed spreader back into the messy garden. I realized I was just throwing them into the pavement, so I'm not doing that anymore. Okay, I think that's the best I'm gonna get it. <laughs> Lauren explained the importance of nature's presence in our daily lives. I wanted to see some facts and data that supported her point, so I met with Emily Grant and Robin Mazumder. They studied the human response to nature and showed me some of the science behind it all. This is the watch that's going to measure your skin conductance and heart rate and body temperature. So, as you can see, we've got your heart rate there, so you're not dead. Always a good thing. Good to know. Um, so, we can just <laughs> start with the study now. Awesome. <laughs> Emily uses virtual reality to study our response to nature. I would be the perfect candidate for this biophilia documentary. She started by getting me really stressed out, by putting me in a fake job interview. 
perfect for this job because I'm already doing it. Okay. So you still have more time. Um. Um. We can stop that. <laughs> And we'll probably get all that data on that watch. <laughs> Once I was suitably stressed, I was immersed in a bustling intersection in one of my favorite cities, New York. Solid. <laughs> Next, I was dropped into a natural space in Croatia, a place I've never been. Okay. And Emily recorded my physiological responses. I'm just gonna stop there for now. So thank you so much for being a part of that. Sorry we had to put you in like a really intense urban environment, but then we can compare to potentially more restorative environments because we've seen that nature can be um, a little bit less stressful mm -hmm. than New York Times Square. Would you like to see your physiological results? I would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is your blood by volume pulse, and that's what's measuring your heart rate as well okay. as your interbeat intervals. And what we can see is this is the stress induction, which clearly it had an effect. Yeah. <laughs> very, very strong, very fascinating with body temperature, really? nice and yeah. high. Um, but then what we also see is when we put you into the natural space, mm -hmm huge relaxation wow. <laughs> in your heart rate. So we actually have like constant stress and then like complete dead relaxed. Wow. In like no time at all. That's, I didn't really feel like I was relaxing that yeah. much more. Like that's insane. People constantly underestimate how restorative nature will be. They think, oh, it's just out there. It's great, sure. <laughs> but I'm fine in urban environments, but actually you can be significantly better in a natural space. Wow, that's really cool. Not only is nature good for our health, it's also good for the health of our cities. Green roofs are a common example of biophilic design, and Vancouver House is one of the most visible in my hometown. Okay. Well, welcome to the Vancouver <laughs> House Green Roof. Thank you. Green roofs play a big role in sustainability in urban cities. This roof provides a biodiverse environment for a whole variety of pollinators. You can see here, just by looking around, I mean, there are literally hundreds of bees up here. Essentially what this is, is it's a mountain meadow in the middle of downtown Vancouver. A green roof is like a sponge. It absorbs the rainwater when it falls and it keeps it from making its way to the storm sewer, which gives the storm sewer a little bit of a break. If you look around, all you'll see is steel and glass and concrete. And that lends itself to an overheated environment. What this roof does is it, it it pools the local air down and improves the air quality. So that's why this green roof plays such an important role in a big city like Vancouver. Green roofs serve many purposes. Vertical trellises bring nature to small spaces. Rooftop farms provide food for urban communities. It's so cool that somebody, you know, took the time to plant sunflowers on top of a building. And industrial living roofs recycle and clean water. When we reintroduce nature into our buildings, it can bring about amazing changes in our cities. There's clinical evidence that supports that gardens and landscape um, contribute to health and well-being. One of the world's most iconic examples of this is the Van Dusen Botanical Garden Visitors Center. You can see the curvy shape, and that building was designed after an orchid leaf. And so I think the connection of a, a flower, which is a living, breathing thing and it needs water light and sunlight to grow we felt like this is a living building in 2014 it won the world's most sustainable building award that was a highlight for us because the world's a big place yeah. and there's lots of projects this garden acts almost like green lungs for the neighborhoods of vancouver it's a building that collects water it collects its own heat and energy to power the building philosophically it to me, it still checks all the boxes of a, of a biophilic project. Biophilic design doesn't just improve the city, it can also improve the lives of the people who live there. In Vancouver and many cities um, across the world, I feel that modern planning ideologies has allowed cars to really invade every available space. Mm, yeah. And a lot of the work that I do is actually taking those spaces back, converting them into plazas, and slowly teasing them into what we hope to be 
Robson Square. Originally, the entirety of this strip we see over here was a street. Cars ran through it, it was all traffic, and closing it off allowed two spaces to be linked together. On one side, you can see the art gallery with steps coming down and some art features. There's a portion of UBC's campus is also here. On the other mm. side, you have water features and meandering greenery um, and cascading steps that allow both cyclists and pedestrians to step down. Awesome. So it's kind of got a little bit of everything. Um, it's a very pleasant transitional space for people to pass through, but also mm. linger, um, thereby increasing better mental health, better physical health. People bike through here. It's no longer a space you're just borrowing from vehicles. It's become all these glorious things that frankly speaking, humans have always gravitated towards since mm -hmm. the beginning of time. Well, it just so happens that this is one of my favorite spaces. That got me to thinking. If natural design improves our buildings, our moods, and our cities, what else can it affect? Different kinds of spaces have different kinds of functionalities, and biophilia may be more or less appropriate for the kinds of function that you're really looking for. So when I look at this space, I see a number of different things that um, um, resemble biophilic components. So for example, one of the things that you notice immediately about this environment is that it's uh, very open, so you can really have uh, beautiful lines of sight. Researchers tend to call that permeability, so you're able to see far out. Uh, at the same time, there are, there's lots of opportunities here in case you want to seek privacy to go to a corner where you're not kind of completely exposed. This idea is consistent with this old idea in the field called prospect and refuge. That being that people tend to like uh, spaces that, that allow them to see out, but also have opportunities for them to kind of seek refuge and comfort if they feel like doing that. I'm saying a learning environment is a biophilic environment. Uh, everybody's engaged with each other. There's uh, a, a sense of feeling and needing to collaborate and be together that already is, in a way, is biophilic. How do you create a sense of relief through, you know, Bi biophilic design, comfortable furniture. It's another really important feature that sort of interacts with everything else. Uh, there's been loads and loads of research on psychology of color. Uh, by and large, uh, people tend to prefer colors that tend to fall in the blue-green palette. The reason why we like green and blue palettes is because they resemble the color of the sky and the greenery that we see that we like. And the reason why we don't like browns and yellows is because they tend to be associated with decay of biological matter. There are ways to bring biophilic design into the office building that not only increase productivity, but also increase happiness because mm. there's an innate connection to the natural world. This is uh, a place that we, we cut this hole out to allow this big stair to come. Oh. And uh, we have large group meetings here. So we and, know uh, from research that when we put people in a great indoor environment with daylight, lots of clean air to breathe, and great design environment. People will be more engaged, they will be able to focus better, they will produce more and be more productive, and ultimately leads to a better appreciation for, for the workplace. Uh, I think we, uh, as individuals, are part of uh, nature. And even when we're sitting on this stair, I, I just know every time our studio comes together, it's a wonderful feeling. Another feature that's been studied a lot is the impact of ceiling height on how people feel and think. So this research has shown that if you happen to be in a room with high ceiling, uh, this tends to promote abstraction, which is really good for creativity. And if you happen to be doing the exact same task in a room with low ceiling, your thinking becomes a lot more concrete. So that would be consistent with a, a biophilic feature. And what about our health? Can good design keep us healthy? Can it change the way we heal when we're sick? This connection between biophilic design, health and well-being, and great buildings has been well understood in the healthcare sector for a long time. And, and reliably, the patients who have access to the outdoors and have views of nature are recovering more quickly, purely due to a better, more stimulating environment. Any garden can be a healing garden. However, when they're designed specifically with intent for a particular population of people who may have cancer or may have Alzheimer's or some other disease, suddenly those places are very supportive to the particular kinds of um, illness that they may have. These things that engage us deeply, that are they're found in nature, and yet when we use them in design, it's a wow. It seems like biophilic design influences just about every part of our lives. Our homes, our schools, our work, our health, and our well-being. 
Is it just better? Should nature be the model for everything? This is a really pretty river. <laughs> In my mind, the only model we have of a sustainable system is nature. I, I think it's really important to, to know that biomimicry is not a new idea. Uh, there's an indigenous el elder I work with um, who's become a very close friend of mine, and she, when I told her what I did, she said, well, Jamie, we've been doing biomimicry for thousands of years. And that's why I think nature is the greatest teacher, not in just design, but in business, in politics, in economics, and that when we leverage those ideas from nature, we might create more in harmony with nature and more sustainably. If nature truly is the basis for all good design, then it seems only fair that everyone has access to it. So biophilic design needs to be uh, democratized because if the only people who are benefiting from it are wealthy, that's extremely problematic. When you think about where marginalized people live in a city, they're often in these high-rise uh, jungles, and a lot of those buildings are older, so they didn't necessarily have to fulfill a green roof by law. There's a concept um, and it's called distributional equity, and that's addressing inequities through the distribution of the resource that typically isn't available. The city is in the process of developing a equity framework of how to assess spaces and rank them on which ones are the most viable for upgrade. It, it's related to biophilic design because it challenges the, the, the dominant theories of restoration that, that are offered in the sense that we have to account for these other things. You can't just build a park and that's gonna solve all of society's problems. And so I think it is about creating a demand which really comes with creating awareness around biophilic design, but eventually you do need to make it accessible to everybody, uh, and that is a movement in itself. But what I'm trying to do here is, a uh, big piece of it is that engagement, um, that inclusivity, like bringing people in, um, letting them feel welcome. In downtown Toronto, I met a team of urban farmers who are using biophilic design to bring about major change in their community. So my, my main goal is to increase representation in spaces like this for people of African descent. You know, maybe next year having a big log here in the middle so that you can just come and be in the middle with all the plants. And, and sit down and, and look sit at down. It. Yeah. That's awesome. Right? That would be wonderful. We're right here, smack dab in the middle of downtown Toronto. You know, you can hear the traffic around us. Sometimes you hear the, the, the sirens going off, but we're still growing beautiful food. And actually, the urban farm up on this roof can produce up to 10,000 pounds of food a year. So, black food sovereignty is really about. Um, that we can uh, grow food that's culturally significant to us. I always will welcome uh, the teachings and learnings of my Indigenous colleagues and friends because they're basically been living on this land in a sustainable way for millennia. And then from here on out is where the Indigenous uh, foodways officially begins. Specifically, this rooftop is special because it's the first of its kind. Um, it's the first Indigenous-led program, and what makes it special is we use traditional um, growing methods and Indigenous agricultural practices. And actually, I will be harvesting these tobacco leaves today. Oh, awesome. A lot of Indigenous people come from communities all over Canada, and they come to the city um, to seek resources that their smaller communities don't have. The design is based off of the medicine wheel, mm -hmm. which is a sacred, um, like iconic symbol to Indigenous people. One of the things that impacts them is th when they leave their communities, they don't have access to like, you know, their cultural medicines. It's very hard to find those medicines growing in the city, and these are one of the places that they could actually come to and see them growing. This rooftop provides like more spaces that are geared towards Indigenous communities because there aren't enough spaces dedicated for them, so we kind of create a community for them. Do you think that's biophilic? <laughs> um, it's like a trailer. Biophilic design can help us learn, work, heal, grow. It touches every part of our lives. But the big question is, can good design change the world? I think good design will change the world. I think it is changing the world. I wake up every day inspired because my job is about, about that design world, about how to create design that's inspired by nature. 
It's thinking about the future. What's the future that you want and how are we going to build it together? And if we start to see our lives as part of the greater ecosystem, it's just going to allow for a greater sustainability. I think that's how mentalities are going to shift if we keep up with this biophilic movement. And if that is a mentality of all of us, you know, think of how much could change. It improves our mental health, it improves our creativity, and it increases our ability to learn. These are the places that help us become better people. And that's what's so exciting is that we just have to learn how to listen to nature again. We've kind of tuned her out. And so by integrating back into nature, learning how to listen again, learning how to listen from a new lens, she'll teach you everything you need to know uh, for how to thrive on this planet. You just have to listen and, and find out how it applies to, to your path. Here's the thing. Good design, biophilic design, really can change the world. It can brighten a room, improve our health, maybe even save the planet. It can make us more productive, more creative, more at peace. It can make us all better people. But we have a long way to go to achieve that ideal. So let's keep the conversation going.